Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Desan, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, always a pleasure to be here. And um, um, let me just get to So um, thank you again for a wonderful uh, opportunity. It's always a pleasure to be with you in Belgrade. <clears throat> I'm going to try to talk a little slowly. I know that there is a translation. And the other thing is I use hearing aids. So if any of you would like to ask a question, uh, bear with me if I ask you to repeat it. If you'd like to write it down, that would be uh, better. My objective uh, would be the current practice and some of the controversies in the pathophysiology and the management of Meniere's disease. All of us see Meniere's disease. Um, it's an infrequent cause of vertigo. It's not the common pathophysiologic cause coming from the ear. Vestibular neuronitis and vestibular migraine, as you will here later on from uh, Professor Previn, it's much more common. <clears throat> we all know the main symptoms are fullness in the ear, fluctuating hearing loss, tinnitus, as well as episodic vertigo. There is the typical picture of Meniere's and there is also the atypical picture of Meniere's. People can present with cochlear symptoms only or vestibular symptoms only. <clears throat> Whatever the etiology, the underlying etiology, it remains to be idiopathic. We don't know. Uh, infection, inflammation, trauma to the ear, immune-mediated uh, neoplasm, acoustic tumors with time can actually develop uh, endolymphatic hydra pictures, and they can present that way. Allergies, metabolic disorders, and genetic disorders as well. Many years disease is more common in the female population as opposed to the male population, just like the migraine. So there is some genetic predisposition for that. I'm going to take two or three minutes of your time to talk about a little bit of basic science, ion homeostasis of the inner ear, but then we'll jump quickly to the clinical part, uh, which we all like. The inner ear really is an ionic exchanger between the potassium and sodium, sodium chloride, within the endolymphatic stria vascularis interface with the endolymphatic system. And that what leads to the development of the endocochlear potential and consequently the normal function of both the auditory and vestibular hair cells. What I would like to say is the, that's the stria vascularis and the potassium is recycling. There are three layers of the stria vascularis and if there is, uh, there is an error here, uh, the abnormal cycling of the potassium and consequently increased uh, uh, sodium uh, concentration within the stria uh, that would lead to kind of water comes with it and they lead to increase in the endo endolymphatic uh, space volume to the point that there is the so-called Reisner's membrane rupture and this is when people get the uh, vertigo. <clears throat> they, they also lose that endolymphatic uh, uh, sorry, they, they lose the endocochlear potential and therefore there will be the hearing loss. Uh, what is the metabolic uh, aspects uh, that we're talking about? Many years can be a metabolic problem. Uh, we know that. Aging, um, um, sudden hearing loss, all of these can be metabolic viral, uh, acquired, immune-mediated, or autotoxic medications. If you use genomycin for the sake of discussion uh, to treat uh, infections or, generally speaking, the aminoglycosides that can lead to hearing loss and subsequent uh, high drop. And we know now from a lot of uh, genetic studies that there are abnormal genetic expressions of the channels that it communicating between the stria vascularis and the endolymphatic system. 
So how do we can, can we explain the fluctuating symptoms based on the ion uh, exchange dysfunction? Yes, the symptoms um, can come up with the uh, ion uh, uh, recycling abnormality, and uh, particularly the potassium recycling that's going around all the time between the stria vascularis. And sometimes also what we do with these patients is focus on treating the hydroptic symptoms, especially in the early phase of the disease. And when I say hydroptic symptoms, it's the aura fullness, it's the sense of hearing loss, even early hearing loss, it's also the tinnitus. <clears throat> so it is becoming apparent that Meniere's disease really is simply is an iron homeostatic disorder. The question is, which one? And that we're still trying to answer that question. Um, I do a little bit of photography, not as good as Professor Musa, uh, David. So let's go back to the clinical realities. And uh, what is my approach to many years uh, disease? It's, it's like anything else in medicine. You take a good history, which I think is the most important thing with many years patients, also with the dizzy patients. I, I always say, if you don't have 15 minutes or 20 minutes to spend with your dizzy patients during the first visit, you and the patient are going to be frustrated eventually. So if you spend a little bit of time initially, it's actually going to save you a lot of time because the patient would understand the problem, would understand how to treat it, and then will not call you frequently. So it's a kind of a self-serving uh, interest. We do a neurotologic exam, and I'm going to talk about that, because I don't think that in medicine generally, even in the United States, physicians are taught how to do a neurotologic exam. Um, audio vestibular testing, we need to do these tests so that we can decide what we're going to do next. Radiology, when uh, indicated. <clears throat> In terms of auditory vestibular testing, and I'm not going to talk about testing, I'm just going to tell you what we have and you also have um, in addition to some of the new uh, tests that you would hear later on today. I, I think audiometry is one of the most, if not uh, the only test that is necessary with uh, many years patients. And sometimes even with patients who are presenting with dizziness but don't necessarily have and audiological symptoms or autological symptoms. Dizziness coming from the ear, the ear serves the hearing and the balance. And even though the patient doesn't tell you I have any inner ear problem, the audiogram may, so, may, may show, pardon me, a little bit of subclinical abnormality. Okay, um, I'm watching this, I have half an hour, right? Um, that's, um, we do electrocochleography and uh, we do electrocochleography in our center at different uh, stimulation rates, 7.1 all the way to 97.1. And you can actually get the ECOG signal. I'm sure you, all of you know the uh, baseline, the summating potential, action potential. And actually we do, when we do the ECOG, we get the ABR signal right away. So you don't need to do two tests. So here is a recording using tympanic membrane electrode, and you have the action potential, which is wave one, two, three, and so on. We do ENG testing, especially the caloric test, to look at the caloric response. And uh, even uh, though I don't use that routinely, is the new head impulse test. Um, and you would hear about the utility of these later on. Um, Another test that's becoming, or has become, very important is the um, uh, vestibular uh, evoked myogenic potential. You record it uh, from the neck, and you can have what's called the cervical, CVM, or the ocular, when you record it from the eyes, the ocular vamp. The CVAMP is much more clinically useful because not only it helps us in managing some of the Tamarkin uh, attacks, uh, we'll talk about this later on in details. It, it, it's not very, very sensitive or very specific, but it can help you. But the best utility of CVAMP is when you have superior canal dehiscence, because 
If you do a temporal bone CT scan, a normal population, you will get dehiscence. The question is, is it clinically active dehiscence or not? And that's where the VAMP actually become very helpful. It's a um, early signal, 13 millisecond to 23 millisecond, and that's a, a three attempts, uh, and then you sum them up to get the res resultants. So the CVAMP looks at the lower part of the brain stem. It's an acoustic stimulation of the saccular inferior <laughs> vestibular nerve to the brain stem. Um, ENG, <clears throat> I want to um, share with you at least my experience. Um, we've done um, thousands of ENG testing, and then when we look back and ask the question, what are the most common abnormalities we see on ENG testing? And we all know um, we, we, we can get unilateral uh, caloric deficit, bilateral position and nystagmus, failure of fixation suppression, any abnormalities in the optokinetic pursuit gaze, doesn't matter how you do them, saccades, and uh, peripheral spontaneous nystagmus or central spontaneous nystagmus, and I'll show you some of these examples. And looking at, this is a summary of about 6,000 patients, the most common abnormalities noted on an ENG data would be the unilateral uh, vestibular hypofunction loss, caloric asymmetry. That's the most common one we see. Followed by um, non-paroxysmal uh, positioning uh, nystagmus um, and bilateral loss. Look at, and post head shake nystagmus, or peripheral uh, spontaneous nystagmus. Uh, the abnormalities, what we call the central abnormalities, are not as common. And, and frankly, and our neurology colleagues would, would speak even better for that. Any abnormalities you see on the ENG should be seen clinically. So it's a little bit of redundancy there uh, when it comes to central type eye movements. All right, what is the neurotologic exam? The typical ENT exam, we all know, and the typical neurological exam, we all know, doesn't really focus on the vestibular system. Um, we, we, as ENT physician, we do good ENT examination. We even do uh, endoscopy and this and that. But we really don't look at the vestibular exam. So I'm gonna talk about this. And the vestibular exam boils down to hearing, not the ear. Yeah, we have to look in the ear, obviously. But it's the hearing part and also the vestibular part. We need to look at the neck and head movements because we're looking at the vestibular ocular and also autolithic ocular reflex and the vestibular spinal reflex. Those are the neurotologic office exam that we focus on. The hearing, um, I, I think uh, those of you who uh, are ENT in the audience, if you have an ear that has been operated on, the use of a, a microscope is very important. Use the tuning forks. The tuning forks is still a very good tool to get an idea about the hearing, even if you don't have audiometry in your office. So you can use the 256, 512, one and two, and, and get a pretty good idea. Are you dealing with conductive or mixed hearing loss? <clears throat> Furthermore, I have come to learn when I get bilateral mixed hearing loss, I use the tuning fork to confirm the audiometry because masking of bilateral mixed hearing loss can be very tricky. So keep the tuning fork in, in your pocket. Uh, what's the vestibular exam? Um, you can do vestibular exam first time or um, as you see the patient. And it's really objective documentation. And what do I mean by that? We all get the patient saying, oh doctor, I have had a terrible day yesterday. I was dizzy all day, sick at home, fine. Patient drove to the office, number one. Second, you do the exam and you don't see any evidence of a little bit of latent nystagmus. I mean, that really is not a quote unquote disabling vertigo. And why am I saying that? In the United States, at least, and in some parts of the world where I visit, people use the word disabling vertigo to justify two major surgeries, endolymphatic shunt 
and vestibular nerve section. So to me, I like to objectively document that there is a disabling vertigo. We tell our patients, if you're dizzy, come and see us within 24 hours. You should be able to see something on the exam. Um, what's the best vestibular test? I, unfortunately, uh, I don't have the, uh, this is a video of a dervish dancing. And uh, a year ago, David Z and I were contributing to a meeting and you know, that dervish dancer was whirling like crazy and then we got him and stopped and looked at his eyes to see if there is nystagmus or not. Uh, so it's, uh, that's David Z and that's myself. Now, if there is only one anatomical slide that I'd like you to keep in mind when you're examining the dizzy patient, it's that slide. The semicircular canals on each side, here, your, your right ear, Use your left hand, that's your horizontal, that's your vertical, that's your posterior canal. Same thing here. Each canal is hardwired, hardwired to the eye movement. So when you see anastagmus in the office, you should be able to know where it's coming from. So we know that if you stimulate the right ear by turning your head to the right, or by doing warm caloric, the eyes would go in the opposite direction and then you get nystagmus beating to the right side. How does this happen? The right ear is connected to the ipsilateral medial rectus and the contralateral lateral rectus. So you get horizontal nystagmus. The second most common thing, you put the patient down on the right side and if they have benign position vertigo, what do you see? You see clockwise nystagmus, uh, sorry, counterclockwise nystagmus like that. Why that is? The posterior canal is connected, we talk about the slow phase here, is connected to the ipsilateral superior oblique and the uh, contralateral inferior rectus. So if there is autoconia, what's going to happen is the um, right eye is going to slowly intort like this and the inferior rectus would do that and then you, uh, 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 sorry, uh, the, the uh, the right eye would slowly go this way, the left eye would go down, and then you get your quick face. Same with the superior canal. So keep in mind how the canals connected to the eye muscles, and also if the canals are being excited or inhibited, because as it is, the vestibular system connections are a little bit uh, difficult to follow. When it's inhibited, you're dealing with another set of eye muscles. The best thing, I tell the residents, take that picture, study it all the time, and it would help you when you're looking at any type of eye movements in the office, it would help you to know where it's coming from. How do I do vestibular exam? You can use forensic glasses. We're all familiar with them. But that's what I do in my office, okay? I have a video goggle. Uh, one eye and a um, regular TV. You can do it on a TV or you can do it on a computer. You can record it. You, um, it's better if you record it, obviously. Uh, but that's how I do my vestibular exam. Slowly moving the head left and right. And what you're doing here, you're stimulating the horizontal canals with um, slow motion. And what you're observing, when you go to the left, you've got left beat nystagmus to the right, you got right beat nystagmus. That tells you that you have good VOR, right? And, and then you can do head tilt and you got ocular counter rolling. This is the important part of the exam. You do head shake and you stop and see if there is any post head shake nystagmus. You can do that in the horizontal plane and you can do it in the vertical plane too. And then you do your Dix Hall Pike. Turn the head to the right, lie down, up, left, down, up. I don't hyperextend the neck beyond the edge of the table, by the way. That's, that's very important. You see uh, in books the picture of the patient and with the head is you know, about uh, 50 degrees over the table. With elderly population, you cannot actually do that easily, and sometimes you can get in trouble doing that. So uh, what do we see? Sometimes in active meniers, um, we see kind of just slow type of eye movements. That's the left beating nystagmus coming from the right eye. And the patient may say, well, I'm a little bit dizzy or I'm dizzy. You, you can have it e either way. 
Um, you, this one, again, uh, that's a, uh, uh, what I'm doing here, I'm doing left and right, and you can see that the left is much more evident than the right. And then we're going to do a little bit of head shaking. Now that's the head shaking. All right? And we, we got an idea that the right side is a little bit less than the left. So you're getting a slow drift of the eyes to the downside, and then you're getting a little bit of a left <coughs> beating post-head shake nystagmus. Here, that's a um, spontaneous nystagmus without any fixation. Now, watch what's going to happen when you ask the patient to fixate. Nystagmus disappears. And that, that is a very important sign. Whenever you see nystagmus in the office under forensic glasses or using the video goggles, try to see how the fixation would affect that nystagmus. If it makes it stronger, then that's likely a central type nystagmus. If it suppresses it, it is peripheral type nystagmus. And how is this reflex? It's a very, again, hard wire anatomical pathway from the eye down through the accessory optic tract to the inferior olive in the brain stem, and that would provide the vestibular nuclei with a strong inhibitory signal. And that's why patients who have motion sickness, actually, what do they like to do? They like to sit in the front. They don't like to sit in the back. They like to drive. And the reason for that is because they're using their visual input to suppress the uh, motion sickness. You can get benign position of vertigo with a uh, Meniere's patient, whether it's a posterior canal. <coughs> um, patient, that's a clockwise uh, nystagmus. Or it could be horizontal canal, too. You get a horizontal beating uh, uh, benign position of nystagmus. Typically, actually, the horizontal uh, um, canal nystagmus and symptoms are a little bit stronger than the posterior canal. But you can see that in the context of many years' disease. And then you can treat it, and the benign position of vertigo will disappear, but then maybe the many years need to be dealt with a little bit more uh, aggressively. Um, so we did the vestibular exam, and uh, the other uh, part of the vestibular exam is the stepping test, and i sorry, I don't have the slide, and basically you ask the patient to stand, and stepping first, eyes open until you get the patient used to what's going on, and then you ask the patient to close the eyes, and watch for any either right or left drift. That gives you uh, the Fukuda test it gives you an idea about the vestibular spinal uh, reflex. All right, now, what is the differential diagnosis of Meniere's disease? The first and most common is migraine, and you're going to hear about that. Second, otosclerosis, otos chronic otosclerosis, not early, would lead to endolymphatic high drop, as well as acoustic tumors. <clears throat> superior canal dehiscence can present with typical hydropic symptoms, just like Meniere's disease. Large vestibular aqueduct also would present with conductive hearing loss early, some imbalance, not necessarily vertigo. And then finally, the cochlear aqueduct. I have seen few patients with large cochlear aqueduct, and radiologists would probably disagree with us what is a large cochlear aqueduct and what is not. But that is something that you as an uh, ENT physician should, should make that uh, call. All right, treatment. So we made the diagnosis. We got a hearing test. Hearing test showed a unilateral low frequency um, mixed hearing loss. Um, I don't get an MRI right away. I, I would just treat the patient for, for a little bit and see what happens. And if need be, I can get an MRI later on. But how do we treat Meniere's disease? It depends where you are in the world. Uh, low sodium, again, that uh, is a uh, wrong sign, and diuretics. If the patient is salt sensitive, and here is at least my experience, I try to um, categorize many years patients as salt sensitive, salt insensitive many years. And that, that actually 
is very helpful. And how do I do that? Patients would tell you, you know, the other day I went, I had a Chinese meal, used a lot of salt. The next morning, my ear is full. I got a dizzy attack. Those are the salt-sensitive patients. The other ones, they say, no, I don't think the salt actually um, bother me. So if it is a salt-sensitive patient, what I do? I put them on a low-salt diet, and I give them a diuretic. And diuretic actually improves the circulating um, uh, aldosterone in the body as well through the uh, renin-angiotensin reflex. Uh, not, not as high as we would like to see it because the aldosterone uh, half-life is very short. But that aldosterone has a very positive effect on the striovascularis. And that's the reason, I think, why low salt would help many of his patients. Because a lot of people, you know, you stand up and say, well, how does salt work? And that's how it works. Um, if they are not salt sensitive, then we would not put them on a low salt diet and not necessarily give them diuretics. But maybe you would give them a little bit of steroids. Um, if they have allergies, we'll, we'll try to uh, address their uh, allergies. So, and antihistamines are being used. Histaminic uh, uh, medications have been used. The beta circ we don't use it in the United States, but it's being used in Canada. Some patients swear by it, some patients don't, and I'll show you a study. Um, you read in the literature, oxygen is being used, excessive use of water, acupuncture, acupressure, and I think those work not necessarily by addressing the many years, but paying attention to the patients. Many years patients need a little bit of TLC, a TLC meaning tender loving care. And, and I don't think that's a bad idea if you just assure the patients, work with them. Uh, vertigo is a very um, a destabilizing sensation. I would like to invite each one of you to do a caloric test on yourself. I do this on the residents, the first day they come to rotate with me. You having an ice water caloric, their eyes kind of like this. But believe it or not, their perspective about dizziness changes literally 360 degrees or 180 degrees, depending on your point of view. Uh, the Mania device, some of you uh, have used those. Um, uh, I use sometimes uh, PE tubes. Um, I have um, a handful of patients where I put a PA tube in the office. I see the patient a month later and say, Doctor, it was a miracle. How did it work? I don't know. Maybe it is uh, 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 altering the endolymphatic pressure through whatever uh, ventilation in the middle ear. So why do we have so many treatments for many years disease? I think the reason is we still don't honestly fully understand the underlying pathophysiology of Meniere's disease, what leads to that explosion of the endolymphatic space, which is micro, micro, microliter in, in, in volume. Another thing I'd like to share with you, this is a study by Freiburg and Stolle. It's one of the best studies that you can ever see about the natural history of Meniere's disease. In Uppsala, it was the center of seeing all Meniere's patients in Sweden. So they had a really incredible amount of data. And what you're looking at here, they're looking at years versus low frequency hearing loss. And interestingly enough, the disease begins to stabilize at about five years, high frequency hearing loss, unilateral vestibular deficit. That's the contralateral ear. So we have, if you like to look at it this way, a five years period to try to reverse the pathology of that disease. And I know this is a pretty strong statement, but I think what's going on, the striovascularis as the powerhouse of the ear, with time, gets exhausted and gives up. And once it gives up, that's when the vertigo probably would disappear but patients are left with hearing loss. To me, I have hearing loss. I know what hearing loss is like. The final disability of Meniere's disease, ladies and gentlemen, is hearing loss, not vertigo. 
patients and physicians worldwide are obsessed with treating a vertigo in Meniere's disease. Here is the best way to treat vertigo. Doctor, I'm dizzy at home. Fine. Put the Valium under your tongue, sleep for three hours, and call me back. They all don't have any dizziness after three hours. You can't do that with hearing. So my focus in approaching many years patient is to try to minimize as much as I can the progressive part of the hearing loss. You can use any benzodiazepines are the best. Sublingual. Don't give it to them orally because they're not, they're not gonna, their stomach is not going to absorb it. You can use it rectally. In the United States, rectal medications are not appreciated. So we use uh, sublingual uh, medication. So the acute attack, it's mainly symptomatic. Uh, Ativan sublingual works very well. anti either IM, suppositories, more effective. Reassure the patients. The only group of patients that I admit are the elderly patients that become very dehydrated and home alone, they can't really help themselves. And I tell them there is no driving until you are safely able to do so. This is a vague statement, and it's for medical uh, uh, legal reason in the United States as well. I have to document it in the chart. The patient has been advised to avoid driving or use of machinery until patient is able to do so and feel safe to do so. That's not directed to the patient, it's directed to the legal system, beloved lawyers. <coughs> now, the patient is over the acute attack. Three, four days later, you're seeing the patient in the office, so we're now dealing with um, the subacute phase. What, what are you gonna do? As I said, I want to halt the progression of the stria dysfunction. And if there is a change in the audiogram from the baseline to the visit, I do intratympanic uh, perfusion. If both ears are affected, I do both intratympanic and then give a little bit of oral steroids as well, particularly with significant hearing loss. Chronic. Now, chronic treatment of many years disease means different things to different people. Again, are you dealing with the hearing or are you dealing with the vertigo component? So, low salt diet, diuretics in selected patients. Keep in mind again that there is the salt insensitive, salt sensitive. Diet control is very important, even if they are not salt sensitive. I think a healthy lifestyle would reduce stress. Stress has a significant impact on many years disease. And one thing that has really helped me and helped the patient is say once a week, not every day, once a week I want you to sit down after your morning coffee, write down what happened to you last week in terms of three things. Did I get dizzy or motion sensitive? Is my hearing changing? Do I have tinnitus? Don't tell me that you had a fight with your wife or whatever, or your husband. Um, and then enter tympanic genomycin and, and perfusion. Now, beta circ is being used, um, if I may. So I'm getting a little bit. Uh, um, thank you. Um, beta circ is being used in Europe, in the Middle East, and in uh, in uh, in Canada. And as I said, patients get it. It's not used in the uh, United States because it has not been FDA uh, DA approved. That doesn't mean it's a good or bad drug. It's just the FDA approval is really a kind of uh, uh, bureaucratic process um, for the major part. We don't know the exact mechanism. Um, but recently, uh, there is a study uh, came from Germany where Dr. Uh, uh, Raven is, efficacy and safety of beta histine treatment in patients with Meniere's disease. This is primary results of a long-term, multi-center, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled dose-defining trial. This is the A level of clinical trials, and we, we have uh, Michael here can please pitch in if you, you'd like. So that, that's a, an excellent trial. And um, here is the uh, authors. All of them are uh, pretty well known in their field. And uh, this is part of what 
this study showed, okay? It showed long-term prophylactic treatment with beta-histine dihydrochloride, beta serg at daily doses, two times 24 milligram or three times 48. Actually, there are people in Canada now that they're using even 72 and, and uh, milligram and more. Does not change the time course of vertigo episodes related to Meniere's disease compared with placebo. So there is no difference between putting patients on beta circ at these dosage for six months or putting them on sugar pills for six months. The second, this is as quoted from the paper, uh, placebo intervention as well as beta histine treatment showed the same reduction of attacks over the study nine months treatment period. And I think this is probably the first clinical study that I know of I know, that, that used nine months period in uh, uh, treating patients with beta circ or uh, placebo. So what are we going, this is a two months, this is just a, a, couple, a couple of months now old, the study. Uh, I mean, it's published recently. Yeah. So we don't know how this study is going to impact on the use of uh, beta circ. Again, I, I don't use it, but if the patient buys it from Canada, I don't know how they do that, and using it, uh, that's fine. That's their prerogative. I, ca I can't tell them, but I would tell them here is some of the data that you need to look at. All right. A rehabilitation of, of, of many years. Um, definitely hearing loss needs to be rehabilitated with hearing aids and or cochlear implant when indicated. Vestibular rehab is a little bit iffy with the many years patients. Why? Vestibular rehab, by definition, is excessive stimulation of motion to the vestibular system, peripheral and central. And patients in active Meniere's disease don't want to actually be rehabilitated. I mean, they, they are trying to kind of keep steady as much as they can. So don't give any rehabilitation during the acute phase of Meniere's disease. Diet is important. Stress management, again, I keep emphasizing that. And that's where the multimodal approach the physicians, the physical therapist, the uh, audiologist, whoever is available, a psychologist, psychiatrist, even sometimes many years patients just cannot handle the, the, the burden of the disease. And you can see that they are really stressed out, they're crying in your office. So I think those are the patients that you should talk to them about seeing a psychiatrist and get, getting a bit more than self-help stress management. They need a professional help with stress management. <clears throat> Education is very important. Spend time with the patient and the family. Try to empower the patient. Tell the patient, look, you're not going to die. It's terrible to have a dizzy attack, but keep that Valium or Ativan in your pocket. Pop it under your tongue. In two hours, you're going to be fine. And that, that's a very effective treatment. Um, you have to work with the family about the effect of Meniere's disease, hearing loss, on socialization, activities of daily living. Now, as far as commercial, uh, personal driving, I tell them, this is your responsibility. If you feel safe to drive, so be it. However, commercial driving, at least in the United States, requires that we report the Meniere's to the authority as well as flying. I had to ground two pilots. And, and that, that sometimes becomes very tricky. So, and you have to work with the patient depending on your job. If they're doing a desk job, I think you can talk them into continuing with your work. Because work is, work is very therapeutic. Don't let patients sit at home, watch TV. That's the worst thing we can do to our patients. You also have to educate physicians. Um, most primary care, actually, are not aware of the extent of Meniere's disease and its impact. So um, that, that's important. 
Uh, bilateral meniere is there. The incidence is about 20 to 30. This is again from the wonderful study by Freiberg and Stalin. And it could be immune-mediated. Bilateral meniere can lead to the Tamarkin or Tolethic crisis drop attacks. Patient, for no apparent reason, that will see the whole world flipping around or that would fall on the ground. And it's probably immune-mediated component to into it. Most of the studies we do end up normal. Again, the most important two pieces of information are the audiogram to find out where the hearing is and the vestibular testing to find out about the residual vestibular function and the CVEMP would also allow you to make a comparison bet between normal and uh, abnormal. Here is a patient uh, with um, uh, really uh, uh, advanced uh, Meniere's disease, uh, did not respond to low salt diet or diuretics, ended up having to have cochlear implants. Um, Jeromycin treatment is the best treatment for Tamarkin drop attacks. No question about it. Sometimes the steroids work, but generally speaking, Genomycin is the best. And these patients, we have to help them get their appropriate and legitimate disability. They cannot work except in an office uh, environment. This is a patient of mine that uh, had a bad Tamarkin attack, and she gave me the permission to show her picture. This patient was sitting watching TV, stood up, to go to the bathroom, and all of a sudden, this is how she said, doctor, I felt that somebody lifted me up and slammed me in the wall. That's her eye. That's from many years attack. So Tamarkin can be really uh, uh, pretty uh, devastating. Surgery from many years disease. Those of you in the uh, audience, ENT, who do endolymphatic shunt and um, facilitated nerve section, um, the truth is, there are no physiologic basis for either of those two surgeries. The endolymphatic shunt, there is no placebo control. So it's what I call faith-based medicine. People believe in it, but there is no proof for it. There was a sham study by uh, Jan Thompson, Thompson in the 70s, and it showed no difference between doing just the post-auricular incision did not open the mastoid. However, in the United States, there was a group that loved shunt to death. They were shunting patients on a daily basis. Um, and they, quote unquote, reanalyzed the data. I have a little bit of a problem as a scientist. When a data is published and a conclusion is being met, that's it. This data should not be reanalyzed. Because to me, it's a statistical wrenching and torturing to get a result that you want to see. And they showed that, oh no, there is a little bit of effect, but the statistical method, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think a lot of people are doing uh, endolymphatic shunt now. I think in Europe here is, with the exception of two places, I'm not gonna mention, where uh, it's, it's no longer done. What's vestibular nerve section? Vestibular nerve section to me is a nightmare to the vestibular nuclei. Those are very happy nuclei, getting information from both sides, and all of a sudden, boom, you cut one, and then it causes a havoc. Also, the commissural fibers between the two sides. Plus, why really cut nerves that have nothing to do with the disease? Having said that, there could be occasions in, in my 35 plus years dealing with Meniere's disease, I could see two occasions where people needed uh, vestibular nerve section. The surgical treatment that is now really helping us is the intertympanic perfusion. And we call it surgery because that's the way it's classified, at least as a surgery. But it, it isn't. It's something you do in the office under local genomycin, dexamethasone, combined when needed. PE tubes can actually help as well. Uh, we know that drugs get in the middle ear through the uh, round window, uh, sorry, the inner ear through the round window. Um, Helge uh, Rask Anderson showed that, uh, as well as studies in, in Germany. So drugs would get into the um, endolymphatic space and reach a very good uh, uh, level. 
The second piece of information that, since I was here uh, last time, is what's the difference between oral and intratympanic? In terms of dex, this was done by Dennis Troon, who is um, in Portland, Oregon, does a lot of animal work on hydrops. Dexamethasone orally, you get about 50% of the concentration in the endolymph as opposed to 85%. Prednisone, 43% versus 64%. Look at this, aldosterone. <clears throat> aldosterone is a very potent modulator of the stria vascularis. You got 1.5% if you put it uh, systemically versus 51.9% if you do it intratympanically. And there is trials now trying to use aldosterone intratympanically. The problem is the half-life is yet to be um, uh, adjusted. We all know how the genomycin works. It uh, basically leads to type 1 cell uh, death through the um, uh, cyclic GMP uh, pathway, and that would have a significant reduction of vertigo episodes. Plus, it reduces the vestibular uh, dark cells activities, so subsequently it would reduce hydrops. Actually, patients after genomycin perfusion, as well as uh, dexamethasone, would tell you that the fullness in the ear, which is very subjective, has completely subsided. The trouble with the uh, genomycin is the outer hair cell and the basilar turn particularly would lead to a significant high frequency hearing loss, sometimes to a completely uh, uh, total hearing loss, depending on the genetic predisposition, and I'm sure you know that the, there is a genetic uh, predisposition to um, uh, autotoxicity to genomycin. Uh, steroids, we know now that they, they do get in the ear, as you have seen, and they do uh, exert influence uh, on the ionic homeostasis. There is over 200 plus publications since we published this in 2008. There are even more to show that there is a general agreement uh, that the steroids are effective in modulating the inner ear homeostatic mechanisms. Is there a um, long-term placebo control, um, there's a couple of studies that also showed that, yes, it does. I want to show you our data. We use genomycin, 40 milligram. I don't buffer it. Patients actually um, uh, tolerate it very well. And dexamethasone, it's 24 milligram. Unfortunately, this is not available, and it has to be compounded. Uh, there is available 4 milligram and 10 milligram. I don't have any experience with it. However, if it works, that's fine. And, and that, that is an area of research that's lacking, the effect of the different dosage of dexamethasone uh, on the final ionic homeostasis in the ear. Now, we know that the methapretnizolone is not as effective in crossing the stria vascularis barrier as much as the dexamethasone. There is a study in Canada, I don't have the um, <coughs> uh, slide, that showed that after you inject with dexamethasone, within one hour, the concentration, uh, let, let me backtrack a little bit, you inject to the ear, within 20 minutes, the highest concentration is in the endolymph, okay? Within one hour, you see that the dexamethasone completely disappeared. Where did it go? It has been absorbed intracellularly because steroids floating in the endolymph are not going to do anything. Whereas methoprednisolone remained in the endolymphatic space, the scalar uh, media, for about three, four, five hours. From that study, at least the way I looked at it, the dexamethasone is absorbed quicker in the stria vascularis, and therefore it works better and that uh, has been my, my experience. And I, I say my experience carefully because, again, we have not done any placebo-controlled studies. And I'm going to address that in just a minute. The procedure is very simple. You do it in the office. Um, um, the, make sure that the middle ear space is filled with the steroids. 
I'm sure most of you have experienced the ones that do it. When you inject, sometimes the medicine would just come back at you, gushing in, in the external canal. Uh, you, you, you cannot really stop on that. What I would do is suction it and make a venting um, cut in the um, uh, superior uh, quadrant. Um, I usually like to inject in the posterior inferior quadrant so that it kind of accumulates on the round window. But you make sure that you have fluids um, medicine in the ear for at least 20 to 30 minutes. That's the work that Plantiki showed and Helge Rask Anderson showed. Half an hour in the middle ear reaches the highest concentration of the medication in the scala media. Genomycin with Tamarkin and uh, uh, drop attacks. When the speech discrimination is poor, I'm talking about now 10 years down the road. Remember the natural history? In the early phase, I use, geno uh, I use um, uh, steroids to salvage the striavascular dysfunction. But if I see a patient that has many years disease for 15, 20 years, there is no point actually in doing any uh, dexamethasone perfusion because the stria vascularis has fibrosed essentially. And that's why you don't have vertigo and what you're dealing, uh, you don't have hearing loss or fluctuating hearing loss and what you're dealing with uh, vertigo due to residual vestibular function. Uh, the only thing that I would like to share with you is when you decide to do genomycin, please make sure that the opposite ear has good vestibular function. You don't want somebody with bilateral vestibular loss from that treatment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just some data, we, we, uh, the, the genomycin is really very effective, and most of you that have used it would, uh, I know Dusan has, has helped. With the, with the many years, with word discrimination, above 50%, and less than five years, um, or sudden hearing loss, we use um, the dexamethasone. I'm not going to talk about the sudden hearing loss because that's not the topic, but um, many years disease, um, we, we do three perfusions over a period of 10 to 15 days to three weeks, okay? And the most important finding of our data is the word discrimination recovery. Let me say one or two things about that. If you have a speech discrimination of 20%, you put a hearing aid in the ear, it's not going to help. Hearing aids work very well with speech discrimination 50 and above. Hearing aids do not improve speech discrimination. Speech discrimination is a function of the large fibers of the auditory nerve as they process the speech signal. All right. Some uh, individual cases, here is a case, uh, 2002, presenting with this picture, and after injection, uh, that's a uh, five months follow-up. Look at this, this is what's important to me. You can deal with the thresholds with the hearing aid. Now with the technology and the programming of hearing aids, even remotely, you can actually help tune the overall performance of the patient, the hearing aid, but you will not be able to get a 60% discrimination to 90% discrimination with hearing aid. That's another one, going all the way from 40% to 100%. If we look at um, uh, word discrimination, it's just a sample of about 61 patients. Preoperatively, you look at the average speech discrimination, it's about, I would say, 20 to 30 percent. Post-operatively, and now we're talking about five years follow-up, you're gaining about 30 percent. You are now having a 50 to 60 percent speech discrimination. So this year is aidable. Those of you who fit hearing aids would relate to that. You have converted an ear from a non-aidable ear to an aidable ear. This is a cost saving of cochlear implant of about 100 
sorry, about, uh, uh, it's actually cost about $80,000 to, to do a cochlear implant in the United States today. A lot of money versus a three or $4,000 for, for a hearing aid. Now, if we look at the same patient population and compare the so-called um, natural history, placebo, percent of patients that have improved. And you look at tinnitus, fullness, uh, let's look at the word discrimination. The 95% uh, of patients have improved speech discrimination. Now, where did I get the natural history from? It's from the Freiburg and the Stahler study. Within five years, you lose your speech discrimination almost. The placebo, the placebo as you read in, as you read in the literature, the maximum benefit of any placebo treatment is between 30 and 35 percent. Psychiatry has done a pretty good job with the so-called placebo effect. You cannot get an 80 percent improvement of anything by placebo. So your placebo is 30 percent. So by comparison to the placebo, we're getting a 95 percent success. Even if you take the 30 percent placebo of that, then you're ending with about 60% success. That's pretty good with a essentially cheap treatment. It, it doesn't cost much to, um, uh, to do the intratympanic perfusion in the office, as I'm sure you, you do, even if you put a PE tube and then inject through the uh, thing. So definitely it's not the same cost as endolymphatic shunt or vestibular nerve section. <clears throat> so um, since 1996, had a I think we've done even more than 2,000 perfusions. The uh, side effects are minimum. We've had five tympanic mem membrane perf uh, uh, perforations. I treated them in the office, actually. You just patch them with a cigarette paper. Or if need be, you can do a little bit of fat meringotomy, again, in the office under uh, local. But there is no significant middle ear infection. A lot of people would say, we're getting a lot of middle ear infection from the uh, dexamethasone uh, uh, treatment, but I have not had that in, in my data. Um, so in my experience, the only treatment available to us today, even above and beyond the cochlear implant, to recover speech discrimination is intratympanic dexamethasone perfusion. Time would allow us to use other medications. I think the use of aldosterone, the work that Holge uh, in, in Sweden and Stefan Plantke in Germany is, is going to help us tremendously and hopefully in the next five years we'll see um, uh, further uh, medications that we can use. And as I said, the word discrimination comes from improving the um, uh, positive effect on the large cochlear fibers that are responsible for processing speech discrimination, because when you inject the medication, yes, it gets to the scalar media, but it actually bathes the entire internal auditory canal as well. With that in mind, I uh, appreciate uh, your, your time, and thank you very much, and uh, 